All right, here we are. Man, I've been so busy lately. So much stuff going on. I don't even know where to begin. So I'm doing Cameo. If you want two-minute custom videos, $20. Put that all into my Narcan initiative. Um, I guess there's certain states where we can't send Narcan legally, which is ludicrous. I mean, that's something that should be lobbied against, you know, um, federally. I mean, what the fuck? Like, how can you not send in the mail a life-saving drug? So now I have to get, we, we're, we've, I think what we're going to do, um, I already consulted with an attorney and I have an existing nonprofit, the Prodigy Foundation, which was for prison reform. But, you know, so I already had filed with the Secretary of State for that. And I'd started the process with the new Paul project that I'm doing. But it might be easier to make the Prodigy Foundation, to make like Paul project the subsidiary of the existing nonprofit, which is complicated. So I'm getting attorneys. Um, I have an attorney and then I need somebody that specializes in specifically nonprofit. Like I have an entertainment attorney that I use for contractual stuff. Um, and she has a rudimentary understanding of stuff like this, but I need somebody that is like specializes. So I'm going to be raising money for it. We have your, um, anybody that had put in a request for it, we have you in our MailChimp email service that catalogs it and then we have it all like on spreadsheets so it's like ready to go and then we just print the labels but we have to find out the legality of it so that's one thing i was opening up an etsy shop that would have like affiliate sponsors you know like it would have sinister get al profits american dope seth ferrantes um gorilla convict freeway ricky ross's freeway uh boston george's bg apparel um bunch of stuff and so I would get a commission for any of their um, products that are sold through my e-commerce. And I would go on to like my own website um, and it would help offset some of the costs for like my VIP and sponsors on Patreon. And I was originally doing that through Etsy and we cataloged all the stuff. And then we realized that why would we, why wouldn't we just have our own e-commerce site where we could sell it directly? And then it doesn't have to take away from the commission for the affiliate sponsors. So I'm working on that. I'm working on a website. Um, I'm working really hard designing the Narcan, the Paul Project website. We're going to have like our own website with like a guest book and you can like, you know, sign it and say things to Paul. There'll be a dedication page that'll have every picture that I can possibly have, plus all of his footage um, from Kill Horse's film things to honor his life. Um, and what else am I doing? Drug Stories for Truckers is coming out finally. Um, I'm going to get, I'm starting to record a second album called Junkie Mind Tricks. That'll just be skits. You know, it'll be like 12 skits and it'll have a bunch of guest appearances on it. I think I'm going to get all hip hop artists for it this time. Um, I'm not sure, but that's something I'm planning. I'm getting ready for the release of my second book, June Gloom. Uh, we're figuring out what we're going to do with the documentary. I've been uploading footage from it that we're not using, and then some stuff that we're using onto Patreon, working on different stories for Patreon. Uh, it's my anniversary uh, this week. We had tickets to go to Maui, but we can't do that now because, well, because we could die from COVID-19. So we can't do that. Uh, so instead, we're going somewhere locally uh, to a lake, and we're looking forward to that. So that's what I'm doing this week. Uh, second book is in the like last stages of the editing, and then the documentary. Like I said, we're trying to figure out. Uh, I think we might just try to get it right to a streaming network and do like maybe a digital premiere. Probably do it for free on the upper tiers of Patreon. And then you'd be able to buy tickets to like the online premiere, do a Q&A with people that were involved, something like that. I don't know. It's a bunch of stuff going on. Uh, what else am I doing? Getting ready to do a raffle with Mickey Avalon, original paintings, sinister original paintings. I'll throw a couple of mine and uh, some signed memorabilia. It'll be a big raffle uh, to cover all, 100% of the proceeds go to the 
Paul project. We did good last time. That covers the initial filing fees. Uh, but all this stuff's expensive. And then, you know, we got to do the shipping and the website. I mean, just getting the website designed is costing like a thousand bucks, which isn't that much. But for functionality and aesthetic purposes, I want to have a good website. Uh, what else am I doing? So much stuff. It's it's ridiculous. And now I got cameo stuff I got to do. We're sending out the VIP gifts. Um, I will start... It, my, I have an assistant now that's sending stuff out. So if I forgot you for any reason for anything, I'll give you that email. I'm paying this person to do it. Um, I'm going to set that up. I keep meaning to do that. And then you can reach out to them and then you don't have to reach out to me. We're doing a snake ordinance blotter. Um, I've already posted that I think on Instagram. If you don't follow me on, on social media, it's Ryan Leone 85. Uh, I prefer Instagram and Twitter. Those are probably the easiest ways to talk to me. Facebook's too weird. People call me like four in the morning and they're like, yeah, let me see your dick. Do you really watch bro chop or is it just a joke? I'm so, I'm, I'm so wasted. You could tell me anything and I won't remember. I swear to God. Well, who are you? Do we know each other? No, I, I'm, just, I'm wasted. I, I'm, I'm so wasted. I gotta go. What the fuck? Like, you know, random girls in Zimbabwe call me. Karina's like, who is that? I'm like, I have no idea. And then like some like crazy, like Zimbabwean dick shot comes through and she's like, I knew it. I've always known you were into dicks. And I was like, ah. I think that's all I have to say for the uh, intro. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the little notification bell thing. Uh, oh, we did a Karina video, second one. We already have one up. We're doing a second one uh, for Patreon. We already recorded it. Put that up this week. Um, we got non-disclosure agreements to put up for various secret Patreon things to show. And uh, check out patreon.com slash Leone. Cameo.com slash Ryan Leone 85. Amazon has my book. Jeez, fuck. Just plug all your shit. Why are your intro so long? Uh, I don't know. I'm a greedy piece of shit. That's why. So let's get into the story. <clears throat> so we're in the breakdown story. And basically, I just had a falling out with Paul, which I feel bad about. Of course, he just passed away. Uh, so it's kind of difficult. Um, Re you know, lately, I, because, I mean, this storyline, especially this, I started losing my mind. I, I literally lost my mind. I had an emotional, mental, and wiener breakdown. It just stopped working. And then I would just nut for, out of, you know, like if I got, if I farted, it'd be like, I'm like, nut would just, no, I'm just kidding. That didn't happen. But, um, you know, I kind of lost my mind. And then right before that, I was, I was heavily strung out on alcohol. I was shooting Sabox in the whole time too during this period. So my memory is spotty at best. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of footage from this period. A lot will be in the documentary. A lot is already on Patreon. Um, and I'll post some of the breakdown videos um, on YouTube as well so that you guys can see it, um, kind of give you a taste of what Patreon's about, what, what the footage looks like and everything. Um, so, you know, I, I had a falling out with Paul. And then Tony was supposed to do the music supervisor stuff. We we're getting ready to pay him 10 G's. We had, I had a bunch of phones. I mean, I had phones from like the early 2000. I had razor phones with pictures. And basically we wanted to get all that stuff extracted. That cost thousands of dollars. We had to go to a professional company to extract it. I started getting press offers um, for a number of publications, newspapers, magazines, online magazines, uh, just a bunch of different stuff. So I had a ton of stuff going on. I'm living at Jeff's at the time. Zach and I are already starting to fight. Not fight, but like bicker. Um, Gabriel had already taken off. So he like that was short lived. He came for a little bit. And then um, I don't know if I got into that. But basically he had he had taken off you know, after he was after I'd yelled at him too many times. And he's the director of the documentary to this day. You know, just like with Santos, him and I have a very love hate relationship. I just have that with certain people. I don't know. There's certain people that I never fight with ever. 
and there's people like that I fight with all the time. So I had a lot going on and I was on the phone all day, every day. I was working out a lot. I was on a very strict paleoithic diet, which is what I recommend. I'm getting in shape again and I'm going to start doing um, workout videos and I'll go over dietary stuff as well. So you can get hot and tan, be buff with a small dick, shit like that. Even for girls, you can be buff. Dudes love that, you know? Um, so that's like what my life looked like at that time. And we we're just getting ready to do the shoots with Sasha Gray, the porn star, Mark Boone Jr., Sons of Anarchy, and Chris Hanley, producer of American Psycho. Those were like our celebrity interviews. So I had all this stuff going on. And when the, the script for Love in Vain, I don't know if we had talked about it, but it came out, you know, and Love in Vain is Wasting Talent. So my first book, the one that I wrote when I was in the feds on a five-year term, um, is called Wasting Talent, in case you haven't read that or you didn't know that. And you just thought I was a bitch. Oh, look at how fucked up that guy's life is. I feel like a lot of you guys are like, that's cool. My life is fucked up. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's life is funny. He's just such a fuck up. <laughs> Let's laugh at him. Uh, but Wasting Talent was my book. And I sold the rights to Will De Los Santos. And uh, yes, I say it every time he wrote Spun. He wrote and produced the movie Spun. So he had had a successful cult drug film come out. And I thought that he'd be perfect for it because of that. You know, I'd learn later that just because you've written a drug movie doesn't mean that, you know, um, that's something that you would want to do again, but he was down for it. Out of all the people that I'd contacted, at first it was with the guy from Drugstore Cowboy, which nobody's like seen. I came out like on, what, what, not Laserdisc, what's the other one? There was one before that that was like super old. I don't even remember what it's called, like Beta. Is that what it's called? Beta? It's in like a, it's like small, it's like a VHS tape, but it's like this big. It's like, super high tech shit in the eighties. So when like Atari was out, um, yeah, we had that on, uh, on beta. I turned out fine. Watching drugstore cowboys as a child. I was like, damn dad, are those guys doing heroin? My dad's like, yeah, don't do that. I was like, okay. I, I swear to God, I won't. Um, so, you know, I thought Santos would make the best writer for it. So the first thing he did in, we had um, we had broken the news that the film got optioned through Gonzo Today. Gonzo Today is, I mean, Gonzo is synonymous with Hunter S. Thompson, who wrote Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Gonzo journalism is a style of journalism that he invented in like the 60s. I'd say probably Hell's Angels and um, was like the precursor to that. And then the, was it Fear and Loathing at the Kentucky Derby or whatever it was? That was like the first Gonzo piece. And what he would do is he'd throw himself in the center of whatever he was doing. You know, if he was writing about the Hells Angels, he started hanging out with them. And then he got smashed out by them. They beat the fuck out of Hunter. And, you know, if he had to go to the Kentucky Derby, took acid and went, Fear and Loathing, that originally was just to cover um, the... Uh, the uh, I don't know some sort of I think like motorcycle event or something I don't even I do know I'm just blanking out on it right now and he also covered um some conference for dangerous drugs with all cops and feds and he thought it'd be funny to like take acid and go cover these things well I mean he had a whole you know briefcase full of drugs and they actually just expected like a magazine article and he gave him like this huge manuscript, which would eventually be Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas that Johnny Depp and Benicio Del Toro portrayed in the 1998 film, I believe it was 98. Um, and it's one of my favorites. It was my first tattoo. I have that tattooed on me. It's really weird. See that cigarette holder right there? The first time I met Johnny Depp, you know, we were like talking Hunter stuff because I'm a diehard fan and so is Johnny. And this is my first tattoo. I got this when I was like 17. I wasn't even like old enough to be able to have one and I like somehow got one. Uh, <laughs> part of the underground, you know, I think I just forged the signature or something. I don't remember. But um, the cigarette holder, which is from the film was actually Hunter's cigarette holder. And it's like his iconic thing. And Johnny gave me that cigarette holder. Cause I was like, look at my first tattoo. And he's like, Oh, he like hugged me. He's like, thanks brother. 
And then like later that night, he's like, here, open your hand. And he just like dropped Hunter cigarette holder in my hand. And I was like, Oh my God. He's like, you can have that. It was pretty much one of the, besides having a kid, it's seriously the coolest thing that's ever happened to me. I mean, seriously, think about that. That's the first tattoo I got. It has that cigarette holder. Then years later, Johnny Depp gave me that as a gift. Like torch the little, he passed the torch of the gonzo um, to the next generation. I thought that was really cool. It's weird. Like my tattoo manifested and like came to life. Um, I have pictures of that on Instagram. But um, anyway, so gonzo today is a magazine that I guess covers entertainment and counterculture news, um, pretty much everything that encompasses the spirit of Gonzo. And they had wanted to write a piece about me for a long time because I'm friends with Jonathan Shaw. Jonathan Shaw is a tattoo artist. He, he's the one that did the thug life on Tupac's stomach. Um, he tattooed on, on a bunch of people. He beat up Charles Bukowski. He's a fascinating guy. Wrote a novel called Nar Narcissa. Um, and I'm actually in a documentary about him, about his life. I'm one of the people that was interviewed for it because we've been friends for years. Iggy Pops in that documentary. Johnny's in that. Uh, Marilyn Manson. Bunch of people. Jonathan's just, you know, was a very well-known tattoo artist in the 80s and turned into a writer. So Gonzo today had asked him if, you know, they could get a piece about me from him. Because I guess he had introduced me as like a young outlaw writer. I think this was in 2016 or so. Gonzo today seriously took like years to get back. I mean, like, he'd be like, yeah, 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 we'll do the piece next week. I was like, oh, great. What time? They're like, oh, Tuesday at eight o'clock. I'm like, okay, perfect. And like, I'm not even like alive at eight in the morning ever. So I'd like set my alarm and I'd wake up and I'd like drink coffee and, I'd, and you know, Karina would be like, what are you doing, babe? I'm like, Gonzo today's calling. <laughs> Please, just getting ready to do this piece with them. checking like my Facebook notification and then they would never call. And this went on and on and on and on. So eventually, maybe because they had nothing to write about. Ryan Leone was a drug addict. He went to federal prison. He wrote a book. It's not doing that well. What do you have to say about all that, Ryan? Oh, well, it was quite the process, uh, writing and then it not doing very well. You know, I mean, there's really like nothing that could be said that wasn't said already. I'd already done various articles at that point. But, when Santos had optioned um, the rights to Wasting Talent to turn it into a film, that's when they wanted to do the article. And um, they were starting a podcast. So they wanted me to have them me on their inaugural episode for their podcast. And they're like, hey, do you think you can get Santos to do it with me? And I was like, yeah, yeah Santos is a slut. He'll do anything I, I say. And I was like, hey, Santos, do you want to be on this podcast? And he's like, I'm a slut. Of course I do. I was like, okay, cool knew it. So we did a podcast and they interviewed both of us. It's actually, it's a, it's really great. If you, um, Google Ryan Leone, Will De Los Santos, Gonzo Today podcast, it'll pop right up. You can still listen to it. It's like a two hour long podcast. I, I, I think I've shared it on Patreon, um, and other social media platforms, probably Twitter as well. Um, but we went on that podcast and even back then, you know, Santos hadn't, um, we had, he hadn't written the script yet. He had just optioned it. So that's how film deals work. They pay the writer an option fee. So I got whatever I got for them to have the option to make my um, film. And that option usually is like three months, six months, a year. And every time that that contract expires, that option contract expires. <clears throat> Sorry, it's so fucking hot in here. Jesus Christ. I, I'm going to open the door because I'm not trying to do a video and like sweat the whole time. It's just, it's out of control. Hold on. Hold on. Was my ass just hanging out? It felt like that. Sorry. We got a pool. I live in a guest house and there's like a pool and it's loud. I know. I don't typically get up in the middle of a video. Be like, hey, hold on. So um, you can t like, if you listen to that early interview, that was probably, this is around the same time. This is right, right before uh, I had met Zach. The reason I'm bringing up, it has some importance and we'll get into it. Um, even in that early video, 
Santos is saying how he wants to change the ending to the book. So the ending of the book, the last third is the Mike version story, you know, but I fictionalize it and um, kind of make it fit with the narrative of the entire book. Um, and he wanted to change the ending. These are some takeaways from that um, interview. He wanted to change the ending because he said that screenplays have to have redemptive qualities, meaning that like something good, like in my book, not to ruin my book, but he doesn't get clean and his girlfriend turns into a whore and sucks. I, just, I, I always have to say, I'm not racist, but she sucks a black guy's dick that has a dick that's the size of a police baton. So what? So he loses his, she dies figuratively, and then he's, a, you know, and that's how the book ends. I was like, I don't know, what do you guys think about the ending? And all my friends were like, it's pretty bomb. I was like, too bomb? They're like, never. Look at Requiem for a Dream. Look how that ended. Jared Leto woke up with his arm off, and he's like, who's gonna, who's gonna love me now, or whatever he says. And then, you know, that movie you always watch, and you're like, hey, <laughs> That's weird. I'm in a bad mood now. Are you guys in a bad mood too? Yeah. Life sucks. It's like, were you in a good mood before the movie? Yeah. Yeah. Weird. I don't know. I'm in a bad mood now. Then like the, a year later, you watch the movie and you have the exact same effect. It's just a depressing movie. So maybe I should have made a happy ending, but that's a redemptive quality. And it's been talked about explicitly how screenplay should have you know redemptive qualities you know the audience wants to go to a movie theater and like eat their popcorn and get jerked off or whatever that you're doing you like go there with your homeboy you're like you're supposed to be jerking me off i don't know what to tell you dog i paid 12 bucks the popcorn alone makes it a 40 dollar night jerk it off what's up why do i say shit like that it's fucking weird my parents watch this. My mom's like, I watched your latest YouTube video. Do you really jerk your buddies off at movie theaters? No, mom. It's just a joke. She's like, oh, yeah, I know. I just had to ask. My mom thought when she read my book for the first time, she's like, did you kill skinheads? No, mom, I didn't kill any skinheads. She's like, did you jerk off to tranny porn high on methamphetamine? I was like, yes, I did do that. She's like, oh. At least you didn't kill any skinheads. I didn't jerk off to tranny porn on methamphetamines. It was after boofing indica bud shake. So anyway, um, and I, so he had said that he wanted to change the, the title. I was like, what's wrong with the title, Wasting Talent? He's like, I don't know. You know, you know, Santos. I don't know. It just doesn't work as a film. It just doesn't. I know because I wrote Spun. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, what do you want to call it? He's like, I'll, I'll think of something. So he hadn't come up with the title yet. And then he wanted Nick Stahl or Emil Hirsch to be Damien. You know, and like, I'm like, uh, I tell you this all the time. I'm like a shameless bully fan. I love that movie so much. It's like on my top three favorite movies of all time. Larry Clark's Bully, if you haven't seen it, check it out. And uh, so we wanted Dick Stahl. I wanted to change the title. I want to change the ending. So I already knew that going in before he had actually adapted it into a screenplay. So after we broke the news to Gonzo today, that was probably, it was right around the time that I met Karina. We met on May 5th. Gonzo today had to have been in May, probably like the end of May that, that uh, episode aired. And then he started writing the script, probably wrote the screenplay and, two months I want to say I mean he did it really quick I mean that's all he did he just focused on turning my book into a script so he calls me one day and he's like Ryan have I got a title for you I was like because we came up with like possible titles and they were just they're they're fucking horrible Damien's addiction the truth about heroin Drugs are bad. Bad are drugs. Drugs and sex. I was like, I like that one. He's like, that was just a plant. That was just a seed. I knew you. You're not an artist. I'm an artist. Uh, I love Santos. I'm sorry. I know you watch my videos. I'm really sorry, dude. Uh, call me, dude, and change, change your number. You haven't like, given me your new one. It's kind of weird. And uh, 
then finally calls me. He's like, love in vain. I'm like, are you? He's like, but, but check it out. We'll spell vain, V-E-I-M. I was like, that's love in vain. He's like, I'll call you back. I was like, okay. I tell Karina, I'm like, he wants to call it love in vain. And she's like, that's fucking stupid. She's all wasted, she's like throwing bottles. She's like, fuck that. You told me that you were going to be rich and famous. We're sleeping at a park. I was like, I, let's see what he says, babe. He might, he might come back with like a good name. And he calls back. He's like, love in vain. V-A-I-N. Love in vain. Do you get it? Vain is in vanity, but spelled like vain, like you chewed up in. I was like, that's it. That's your fucking, that's what's better than wasting talent. Doesn't wasting kind of sound like wasted? Like there's like a druggy, like muscle atrophy, like body wasting, junky heroin chic connotation to that. No, you don't see what I'm saying. You don't see, you don't get it. Wasting talent That's the name of the fucking book. Why can't it be the name of the movie? How often do they change the title of the fucking, you know, movie from the source material? They don't, Santos. You're just being an asshole. And then I looked it up, and it's like some Japanese anime movie. I was like, oh, my God. So that was the first gripe I had. But he went, he, <laughs> you can't tell Santos anything. He goes, oh, this is my vision. This is my vision. Nothing stops my vision. I was like, all right, dude, whatever. Then he sends me the script. Now, the script was pretty adherent to the film. And I'm like reading and I'm like, okay, all right, all right. This is cool. This is cool. All right. Oh, foof. Change that. Why'd you change that? Why why do you change the name of KK Kate? Everybody loves KK Kate. The skin bird, the skinhead slut with the swastikas over boobs. No, I mean, I'm not, I don't like skinheads, but thought it was kind of clever. KK Kate, which by the way is a person I actually knew and I didn't change that name whatsoever. And uh, I was like, ah, he changed. So a couple things that he he changed, and then it gets to the end of the script, dude. I hate the ending. I hate the ending to this day. And Santos finally this year, just this year, he called me and he's like, I'm thinking about changing the ending. I don't know. Everybody likes him until the last ten pages. I'm like, dude, I've been saying that for years. Damien goes on to be a professional clown. He like tours a circus, like giving speeches about sobriety and, and like clown makeup. No, that's not what it was, but it was something ridiculous. So, um, so, the, so now there's script out of me and him start fighting about it. And that's why we had some, I mean, I just watched the interview that he did for the documentary. I'm going to post the full thing on Patreon in its entirety, like not the cuts that are actually going into the documentary. And it, it's a pretty classic <laughs> interview. Like at the time, like I blocked him on Facebook and he's like, look, I'll show you the first time that Ryan ever reached out to me on Facebook. Oh, <laughs> he blocked me. <laughs> it's just kind of this thing we do to each other here and there. It was really funny. The whole interview was, it was pretty classic. Um, so then after, you know, that had all happened, uh, the whole thing happened with my ex's ex-boyfriend who you know, tried to get the whole film shut down. I don't, did I ever talk about that? How, you know, he was a Columbine survivor and he's been on Ellen and Oprah and he's like, I'll get Oprah and Ellen on you. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ellen and Oprah on you. Then your movie won't do shit. I'm like, look, man, I don't have anything against those people, but I just don't see that demographic really wanting to watch a movie where people are looking at their own butthole in the mirror after the fucking a bucket butthole on meth. I don't know. It just doesn't seem like their kind of thing. And then, you know, basically his blackmailing kind of backfired and he just looked like a piece of shit over the whole thing. So anyway, uh, the one good thing though, so the script was okay. I just hated the ending. There are things that he did really well. And then there, the ending is just, I, I can't stand the ending. And I didn't want to see Damien get sober. That's for sure. I, I mean, he's like, but there has to be redemptive qualities. And then like, make him think about getting sober, have an ambiguous ending or something. He doesn't have to get sober. You know, what about train spotting? The dude relapses and then he jacks all his friends and like leaves with like a, you know, a fucking briefcase full of money, like some weird, like European 
electronic music comes on and he does his little like train spotting haiku, you know, I'm going to be just like you, the television, the mortgage, the, um, or whatever the fuck he says. I'm cleaning up and I'm going home. Ooh, McGregor's cool. I just saw Dr. Sleep. That's a badass movie. Sequel to The Shining. If you haven't seen that, you should check it out. I, I really like that movie. But one of the best horror movies I've seen in years. I read the book and I really liked it. It was really good. So, okay. So, anyway. Uh, one of the, the best thing, though, of the whole thing is Nick Stahl. And he's like, I think I can get Nick. Because Nick and I guess Nick had gone on the set of Spun when he was, like, 12 or so. I don't know. However old he was. The movie came out in 2002. So, that is not true. He was, Nick was, I was like 17 in 2002. Nick is 40 now. I'm 34. So six years older than me. He was, you guys were like, he was 22, 23. I think it was 23, 22 or 23, 20. I don't know. It doesn't matter. 22 or 23. He goes like, your math sucks. Me. Whatever. Um, so I guess he had gone on the set when he was young or whatever, and he had met Santos and Santos and had, kept, had kept in touch and they talked all the time and Santos would like call me and he'd be like, Nick loves the script. You're wrong about the ending, bud. He loves it. He loves the name too. Trust the artist. You're not an artist. You're just a writer. Like, wait, aren't you just like a screenwriter? So like, why are you an artist and I'm not? He's like, shut up. Do you know who I am? All right, dude. All right. So at one point he had sent me a screenshot of Nick, like giving praise for the script. Like Nick, you know, Nick's like, yeah, I really like it. Um, I'm down to play Damien. And so he ended up getting a letter of intent, which we've talked about saying that he planned on being in the movie. Now Santos sent me a screenshot of Nick saying that he liked the script Santos usually, because I don't know what kind of phone he has. I think it's an Android, but um, for whatever reason, like when you send a screenshot, it says the person's name and it also says the person's email address. I have an iPhone. I'm an iPhone person. I've always had one. And uh, I don't really know if I'm even saying the right thing about Android. But for, for whatever reason, when he sent me the screenshot, it included Nick's email address on it. And he didn't block. Sometimes he would like, you know, mark it. He'd edit the photo and like, you know, put the little marker thing over it so you couldn't see. We didn't do that this time. So now I had Nick's email. And so now, that's the reason I explained all this. So now, um, you know, we got the documentary partially funded. And we have enough money with Max and other investors that, you know, um, we can actually like afford some nice things for it. And we wanted to get a narrator. Now, Nick had signed on to play Damien in Love and Babe. So he's going to be the main star. Damien is not me, but Damien is me. I mean, everything that happened to Damien happened to me. Except I'm not a bitch like Damien, <laughs> you know? I'm a convict. Damien's a pussy. No, Damien, and you know, I don't know if you know this, but Wasting Town's actually a trilogy. There's two other books that I outlined for it. Like I, you know, I pre-planned the entire trilogy. I was like, it's going to be the twilight of junky books, you know, books. So I sound like Canadian right there. And uh, so he, he was going to play Damien. So I thought that it would be perfect and it would be symbiotic and it would complement the Love and Vain film if he narrated the documentary. So what I did is I sent him an email. I just went, I circumvented Santos and I just wrote Nick and I was like, hey Nick, it's Ryan Leone. Uh, I wrote Wasting Talent. Um, you have signed on to play Damien, which is the main character. You know, he'd read the book, he'd read the script. And uh, I said, now I got a documentary coming out. It's gonna be written by Jim Oles, screenwriter of Fight Club. It's a legitimate film. Do you wanna narrate it? How much would you charge me for it? And Nick had, like we talked about this, he had a fake Instagram account. Like I, I've told you guys this before. A lot of famous people don't really want to get fucked with. Like this is what's interesting about that. Let me just say a side thing. You know, oh, you go off on, on rants. Oh, here you go. For all you motherfuckers that don't like my rants. I wish you guys would just like wait until the prison series again. Because that's like all you want. You just want to hear like my little prison stories. I don't know. It was like my whole life story, so. Here we go with this. This is what I've noticed about people that are famous. So we have social media, all of us, right? 
we're not like I'm not famous, but I have social media. A lot of other people have social media. So basically now we're all kind of celebrities in our own mind. We share like photoshopped or filtered pictures. We're like have you ever noticed that? Like you there's a chick on Tinder or something, and you're like, damn, bad. Dude, then you see her in real life and it's like it literally looks like the lot the uh like swamp thing or something, you know? Like it doesn't even look like a person. There's like like weird like trails when she walks and it looks like spinach moving past her. Which literally just like came out of a swamp. She smells like it and she's just like, ah I like corn dogs. And you're like, oh, holy shit. You're, you're Rachel from Tinder? She's like, oh, I want corn dogs. And then she just like explodes and like spinach just sneezes everywhere on the wall. And like, it looks like a bunch of book. You know. I, don't know. I don't know where I was going with that. But um, so people present fake images of themselves. I mean, there's actual studies that people get addicted to social media because there's a, endorphin and dopamine release there you in the reward um the reward receptors um get stimulated by using social media you post something and like four people like your post you know somebody like we're in like ninth grade with you know someone you went to elementary school with some chick you fucked on like some like weird blacked out week in vegas you don't even know like like i never accepted that friend request that's weird you don't know who she is. And then like one time she just messages you and she's like, Hey, I'm going to be in LA this weekend. Do you want to meet up? And you're like, who the fuck, who are you? We 69 in Vegas. You look at her and you're like, Oh my God, I 69 with that. Ugh. Block. So there's shit like that. Right. And so when those random people like your posts, you're, reward thing it's like a slot machine that's why they make noises and it goes and it makes all those like really like fun like pinball machine noises like do, 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 and you're like ah, you just get all strung out on it social media is the same way i'm completely addicted to social media i don't know why probably just because i'm super narcissistic and i'm like dude 14 likes let's fuck it <laughs> i'm doing it right now um and what i found is people that are truly famous they don't give a fuck about that because it gets to a point where you go around everywhere and everyone's like, oh, dude, it's so, it's so nice to meet you. I'm such a fan. I'm... Sometimes I feel like we're the same person. I'm not saying people do that to me. They do. I've seen, I've been like been with like an actor or something and like go to Starbucks and like, like, women start crying and like cutting their initials into their arm and you're like what the f what's going on is this normal and they're like yeah i'm not gonna say who but i'm i know someone that's very well-known person um a musician and uh like a really well-known rock musician and he told me this story I, like he's like i can't even leave my house anymore last time i was in new york i walked down the street and some girl that was like some diehard fan like saw him from across the street and like ran full speed and tackled him and like bought you know bit a chunk out of his face like put it in like a little gram bag and like just ran off into the night yeah I so i'm not even making that well the gram bag part i made up but the rest of that is 100 percent true um it's wild, you know? So people that are famous, a lot of times they don't even have social media. And then a lot of times when you think they do, when like you're on Instagram and you're like, oh my God, Katie Holmes just liked my post. Katie Holmes, like, someone's not even relevant anymore. But you know, whoever the person is, uh, you know, uh, they liked my, oh my God, that person liked my post. Isn't that cool? And a lot of times it's not even them doing it. They just have a management company, they have a publicist and they like run their social media for them. So a lot of times you'll meet people that still want the social media experience. We've talked about this before. You get famous, you just wanna fuck with people that were friends with you before you were famous because they know that you, these famous people know that those people are their real friends. They don't want anything from them, you know, because that's, you know, when you're, when you get fame or even when you're on the trajectory to, to it, you have to, 
you have to be able to like interpret what everybody's intentions are because everybody has intentions. They're like, Hey brother, let's chill. You want to go snowboarding with me? Sick. Mm-hmm. Oh, Hey, this, there's this book I've been cooking up in my mind. Uh, yeah. I was just wondering if you could give it to like some of your publisher homeboys. What do you think? Chill or not? It's always shit like that, you know? And like, I experienced that on a very, very small level, but like, imagine if you're like, Quentin Tarantino or something imagine what that guy's life is like that I mean I can't even imagine or Johnny Depp or something you know like dude those people they're imprisoned by their by their own fame so you find that a lot of them have fake social media accounts just to just so they can like connect with people they actually know Nick had one of those because he didn't he doesn't give a shit I hang out I talk to him almost every day on the phone and he could give a fuck about fame or about people telling him he's cool or like he doesn't care about any of that like he's a very nice humble intellectual guy that just like has you know he has his own thing you know he follows politics and he likes literature and he likes art he likes music and he just wants to be left alone and like do the things that he enjoys like hang out with his daughter and you know do things that he thinks would actually matter and in a lot of ways I wish that more people were like that, but social media has done the complete opposite. That's made us all have this sense of false importance. Every single one of us, me included. I'm like, damn, I am important. (laughs) Hold on, I gotta go. I gotta go, hold on, hold on. I'm a 30 today. (laughs) I'm a 30. Karina's like, what does that mean? I'm like, 30 in importance. (laughs) I just like run out the door. She's like, what a weirdo. Um, you know, everybody kind of falls into that if you're on social media and I've been for a while, I'm like, man, I kind of just want to be off all social media, you know, uh, just to like cleanse. Cause I stop, I kick TV and it's been amazing. It has been an amazing experience for me. Um, I read a lot more. I, I make art, um, I'm work out. Like I do things that are way more important than what, than like just being a zombie being like, Oh my God, dude, Tiger King. It's so provocative. This shit's dope. Let's tweet about it. Let's see if other people think it's as dope as I do. It's like, man, that shit gets very mindless. So Nick is like that. He had that fake Instagram account. So I tried to DM him. He accepted my um, my thing, you know, and he followed me back. So he was following me from his fake account for a while. And like once in a while, I'd comment on his pictures and he would comment back, but he would never respond to my DM. When I emailed him, he called me. I left my phone number. He called me immediately you know, like probably like within a couple hours, because I had offered him a job. I said, Hey, like, I want you to narrate this. And he called me. And from the first conversation that we had on the phone, um, it was just clear that we had a lot of similar interest. You know, he had, he had similar struggles, you know, in his background. Uh, We had the exact same taste in pretty much literature, art, music, we, we really have the same taste in a lot of stuff. And he's just a really, really humble down to earth guy. And he, you know, I sent him a sizzle for the project. I sent him a marketing deck, all the little, you know, fancy things that we had to promote the film. And he wanted to be involved and he understood what my, what the purpose of him narrating my life story would be. It's like, well, you're you're loosely playing me. You should be the person to narrate my documentary. You know, kind of like when Johnny Depp uh, narrated Hunter S. Thompson's because he played Hunter in Rum Diary and, um, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. And I kind of, you know, I've always had such a high affinity for Hunter and for Fear and Loathing and for Johnny. I just thought that, you know, it'd be kind of in the tradition. So him and I started becoming good friends, you know, just telephonically at first, you know, we would talk on the phone for hours. I never shut the fuck up. Like if you get me on the phone, I just do not shut up. People pull shit like this all the time when I'm on the phone. Like I'll be talking and they'll be like, yeah, man, cool, cool, cool. And then it'll just go silent. And then I'll get a text message and they'll be like, hey, brother, got to go to sleep. Lost you. Phone cut off. All right. Have a good night. But I'm like, come on. Come on. Hey, and I'm not, I know who's watching this and thinking that I'm signaling you out. No, 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 no. People do that to me all the time. I don't shut up. It's cool. And on YouTube, you can just like, eh, I'm sick of hearing this motherfucker. He's all full of himself. And he just, his stories suck now. And he just talks about stupid shit. I'm going to turn it off you know, on the phone, you can't really do that as much. So, uh, Nick was, a, you know, he would listen to me. We talk about a whole, a whole wide variety of stuff. And I guess it was the first, like, 
actor that I truly respected that uh, I started forming like a personal relationship with. Um, I'd been around people like that a lot, but I didn't, I didn't really connect with one the way that I had with Nick, you know, uh, he was humanized, you know, it was like, I started getting disillusioned by the whole thing. He's just a normal guy. I mean, they're just people. I know people think that like certain actors, like if you really like an actor, you think that they don't, you know, like forever. I seriously thought that women did shit. I know that sounds really stupid. It's not even that I thought that I just didn't think about it, you know? And then somebody showed me this video. I don't even know where this is. I've looked for it because I hope that it has the same effect on me that it had like the same effect on others that it had on me. But there's like some video of hot chicks just taking shits from like a fucking aerial, like from like, like somebody like put like a fisheye lens, like in a toilet bowl. And it's just like hot chick shitting and it'll like show their face while they're shitting. So it's like split screen. It fucks you up. Like you watch that. You are never going to write a girl a poem again. Promise. Like after that, you're just like, fuck they're people. (laughs) <laughs> they're not objects fuck that i'm not putting any work into that if you like me you like me i'm not writing you some rhyming poem that takes me 10 hours i'm cool <laughs> later i'm on a weird one tonight um so nick and i started having like nightly calls and i'd ask him a lot of questions uh, i guess about fame you know like asking him what that was like and He's interesting because he's been pretty well-known actor, a recognizable actor, you know. I'm with him all the time in public and people come up to him and be like, hey, what's up, John Connor? Because, you know, he's John Connor in Terminator 3. Uh, or uh, he was the yellow bastard in Sin City. He was in that movie Disturbing Behavior with Katie Holmes of all fucking people. Maybe I was just subconsciously thinking that. Um and so, like, he started acting as, as a young age. He was in that movie, uh, oh, my God, why can't I think of it? It was with Mel Gibson, um, Man Without a Face. That was, like, his breakthrough through role when he was a kid. So he doesn't really, like, you know, remember what it was like not to be recognizable or to have fame. He had it from such a young age. I, I truly don't think he realizes that uh, his lens of the world is a little different than other people's that aren't famous. And uh, you know, he's just, he's been that way for so long. I mean, he looks at it, he's a true artist. He looks at that shit as a craft, you know, and he's a great, he's a, he's an amazing, um, actor. He was in, in the bedroom, which was an Academy Award winning film with Marissa Tomei. He he was amazing in that. He's just been in a lot of good shit and he was great. Bully's my favorite. If you want to check out one movie that I recommend by him, check out that one. Um, so, so we had these like nightly calls and I had a whole, like I had a a bunch of different characters that I talked to every single day. I looked at it as work related in the beginning. Nick and I's relationship was more work oriented than what it's become now. Now we just talk all the time just because we're into the same stuff. We talk politics and we talk like we send each other Spotify songs like every day, you know, and um, we're just, we're friends outside of like work and stuff like that. You know, it's just a separate thing. Um, but we have done some work stuff together as well recently um, and back in this period. So around this time, um, I started really getting into it with my attorney, Adam Perlman, who's repeatedly said that if I ever slander his name, that he's going to sue me. Fuck you. You're a piece of shit. You're a horrible attorney. Fucking sue me, dude. You know, any names that I say in this, uh, in this video are coincidental that you're a scumbag. You should be disbarred. D bar, disbar, I don't know. Um, so like him and I started getting into it. And let me tell you why. So my friend Seth Ferrante, who we've talked about on a several occasions, he's that guy he did 21 years in the feds, faked his own death, got on the US Marshals top 10 most wanted list, got arrested, did 21 years, became a journalist for Vice, uh, Penthouse, et cetera, et cetera. I talk about him all the time. He's the godfather, he's Nico's godfather now. He's like one of my closest friends. And Seth was working for Penthouse Magazine at the time. And I showed you guys that in a separate video. And he was working for Huffington Post. He was working for Vice. So he knew that I had the documentary coming out. And he's just like, hey, I'm going to hook you up with a bunch of coverage. I'm just going to get you a bunch of articles. I was like, cool. You know, and he doesn't do that for everyone. People hit him up all the time. They're like, hey, we do this one. He's like, no. You know, he's always supported me because um, because I, I was a convict. You know, I wrote my book in prison. And he's huge on convict rights. He's a solid ass dude. You know, sends 
people books in prison all the time. That's where I picked that up from just seeing how he was and kind of like emulating what he was doing because I thought it was a nice thing. So he wanted to do a article for Penthouse Magazine. Or yeah, that was like the first one. It was actually going to be in the print. I showed you guys that on another video. They wanted to talk to my attorney to get a comment because they interviewed the alleged prostitute in the case for the pimping and pandering thing. Like they interviewed her, they interviewed Tony O'Neill, the writer, um, Will De Los Santos, Jim Oles, Fight Club dude. Um, and they didn't interview Nick. We offered Nick to do an interview for Penthouse and he didn't, he's just, I don't know, he doesn't do a lot of press anymore. Um, he's just like, eh, I'm cool. Like none of that shit, he's just, he doesn't care about that kind of stuff. And he didn't know me well. Like nowadays he would definitely do that for me. But back then we didn't know each other well enough. We had just met telephonically, like I said. So even in, even the prostitute in that penthouse article said that I'm not a pimp. She goes, Leone's no pimp. He's a simp. He didn't, she didn't say the simp thing, but she said, Leone's no pimp. Word for word, verbatim in penthouse. That magazine was printed hundreds of thousands of times, distributed internationally. She said, I'm not a pimp. So I started getting the idea that the press was giving me favorable attention, at least with Penthouse, Vice, and um, Huffington Post, I knew that Seth was gonna give me at least quasi-favorable coverage because we were actually friends in real life. So, the fr so I was like, huh, maybe if we sway public opinion, it can help me with my case. So I, it was important, obviously, to get Adam to, to, um, you know, to make a statement to them. Like, well, you know, you know, attorneys are, well, my client has a great big pendulum swinging hammer cock. And no, he's off drugs now. And he's no pimp, just as the prostitute would say. I mean, you know, coming from an attorney can be very effective in, a, um, in an article. So I tried to get him to do um, a statement. And I called his office and his secretary's a straight up bitch, right? just miserable, you know, like California raisin face, like, Ugh. like one of those, right? I called her. I'm like, Hey, um, how you doing? She's like, what? I'm busy right now. I'm like, listen, um, I need Adam to make some statements to the press. And she's like, why would the press even want to interview you? You're nothing but a pimp. It's like, what, the, what kind of, what kind of law office is this? What do you, you fuck? This dude's always lecturing me. You're telling me I'm a pimp. What the fuck? I'm a client of yours. What are you talking about, dude? Give me his phone number. Give me his cell. I need it. There's this is time sensitive. They're about to run this in a national publication. What the fuck is wrong with you? And she's like, well, oh, I gave you his number last week. I'm not giving it again. She hung up on me. I was like, are you, are you kidding me right now? Fucking piece of shit. I, so I call back. And I, I leave like the most scathing voicemail. I'm like, listen, Adam, your fucking bitch little sidekick. I said, you guys are, are the worst attorneys I've ever dealt with in my entire life. This is the worst firm I've ever dealt with. You guys are, are literally insane. I'm getting positive press attention. Why aren't you covering me? What the fuck is wrong with you? And like, I think I was like saying like punk, bitch shit like that you know it's using like words like like prison words like when i get mad like the real like like the white trash comes out of me i'm like you fucking punk ass bitch wow oh, you know I, and people are like why are you talking to that action I'm, oh, I'm fucking angry that motherfucker he's a fucking punk man <laughs> starts spitting a lot more than normal so adam ends up calling me back and he's like he's like listen what you did is completely unacceptable you don't call my secretary and you do not. You, and I said, you know what, dude? I don't need you. You're a piece of shit attorney. I'm about to get big. I'm going to get public opinion. I'm going to get quoted in the press. I'm going to tell him what a piece of shit attorney you are. And he said, you know what? It's time that you find a new attorney. And if you ever say anything to the press, I will sue you for slander. Well, I did put some shit in the press. And <laughs> I'm still not sued for slander. What? So what? And you're, you're a scumbag. I'll give you a bad Yelp review. And you did a horrible job. Um, so he basically quit. So I called my dad, you know, my parents and I were like on good terms at this point. And he, and I'm like, dad, um, I guess like Adam and I just had like a mutual falling out. Like basically he quit and basically I fired him simultaneously. He's like, well, what is it, Ryan? Which is it? Did he quit or did you fire him? I said, I guess I fired him. He's like, 
I never liked that guy anyway. I was like, no, because we were used to Robert Sanger, who had, uh, he was one of Michael Jackson's attorneys. And that dude was a, but he's a shark. Robert, if you're in Santa Barbara and you get in trouble, go to Sanger and Suisen. That, those are the best attorneys that I've dealt with there. They're, they're sharks. He walks into the courtroom and like people just like start throwing their high heels off and they're just like, oh my God. He's like a rock star. They like throw panties up at like the, no, they don't. He's like some bald guy with like a beard and shit, like little glasses. But um, but he's a really good attorney. And like, it's the kind of attorney where you walk in with him and they're scared. They're like, fuck, that guy, that guy like is actually like, the first time I ever talked with him, he's like, he's like, yeah, they want you to, or one of the first times I was in the feds, he's like, they want you to snitch. And before I could even respond to it, before I, I could even say no, he said, it's against my religion. I was like, hell yeah, what is, that's a solid attorney right there. He's like, it's against my, I don't even, I won't even represent you if you even consider it. It is against my religion. He does not talk like a black soul singer, but he did say the religion thing. So after I ended up firing Adam and telling my dad about it, my dad gave me an insane revelation. And he said, Adam's the one that told us that Karina was arrested for accessory to murder after the fact. My attorney said that. The reason that my parents wouldn't let her come over and the reason they hated her so much and the reason they ultimately got a restraining order besides the fact that we were always wasted and like having like allowed like anal sex to like dubstep and shit like in my house and po like just doing like weird perverted shit was because Adam Perlman told my parents that she had been arrested for murder after the fact. He had represented her for a misdemeanor DUI case. That's it. He got her house arrest. That is not accessory to murder after the fact. Accessory to the murder after the fact is like when you kill somebody and like you go to like, like someone comes to my house and like, Hey, Ryan. Oh, Hey, what's up, Bobby? What are you doing? Oh, nothing. It's two in the morning, man. What, why you at the pad right now? Oh, I, I just killed somebody. Oh, why? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Cause I'm homophobic. You know, oh yeah, yeah. All right. He's like, hey man, can you uh, can I leave this? Can I leave this shovel here? It's got blood on it, shit like that. Some chunks of hair. It ain't no big thing though. It ain't no big thing though. Bobby, you know I fucks with you. Leave that shovel here. All right, cool. And then like three years later, Bobby goes to prison for murder, and then like they find the shovel that's accessory to murder after the fact, like helping somebody cover up a murder afterwards. So I just found that out. I tell Karina and she's like, no way. That's crazy. I was like, yeah, Adam's the one that put you on blast for something you didn't even do. She's like, what a piece of shit. Fuck that dude. I'm like, yeah. So at this point I had started smoking pot, right? I started smoking pot. I was like, you know what? But I'm, I'm getting all these articles written about me. I'm get, have this documentary getting filmed. There's big, you know, um, fucking film crew showing up after they hang out uh excuse me dre yeah we gotta go we gotta go film ryan leone he's uh some kid in santa barbara sorry dr dre we gotta go like i thought i was like the shit so i was just started getting more cocky so i started smoking pot and i started you know it was an all it was all women that would watch me pee so there are ways to get around it and i started getting syringes at this point because i was smoking weed every day i was like eh, fuck it Usually I just take like one or two hits once a week and you can get that off. That'll go out of your system within the next day. You know, it doesn't stay in your system 30 days. If you smoke once or twice when you're on probation or parole, or if you have a job coming up, you can do it once or twice. I'm not telling you to do this, but, um, but I did it and I used to get away with it. I mean, it doesn't store up. It's in, it's, it's, it's fat soluble. You know, it's, or it's, it stores in your fat cells. That's where THC stays in your system so if you do like one it's it's an accumulative buildup that's why you test dirty for weed for thc and uh so i just started smoking every day and i started i like went hard i was like buying like slightly stupid hoodies i was like dude let's smoke weed and listen to slightly stupid everyone's like dude that'd be so rad let's do it um so i just like got like back into smoking pot and like you know i was kind of stressed out at the time so it was helping me and one of the things that I would do, I did a variety of things to try to beat the drug test. One of the things that I would do is I would get an insulin syringe and I would fill it with bleach and then I would just cheek it. It would just be in my butt cheeks. And I'd be like, oh yeah, I'm here to test. And I'd go in and I'd uncap it and I'd, you know, squirt bleach in. 
and then I shake it up. And what that does is it makes it inconclusive. It's just a dip panel. It does not work if you send it to the lab and it smells like bleach. So it's kind of risky, but you put real pee in there and then you put bleach in and it will, it can alter the test and it can make it inconclusive. A lot of times they stick a dip stick in. It doesn't say inconclusive. It just won't come up as anything, you know, it just won't read it. It fucks up the results because they're, they're like testing for metabolites for different drugs or the metabolites the different drugs create when it metabolizes in your body. So I was doing that for a while and I get a phone call from Josh, my PO that hates me. No matter what I do in therapy, he hates me. And he goes, Ryan, we got to talk. I said, what's up? He said, you came up dirty for amphetamine. You know, I don't know if we had talked about this in a previous video or not, but, um, you know, this goes into like the next part of this. I don't know if I'd already mentioned that this had happened, but he called me and he said, Ryan, you've come up dirty for amphetamine. I got a false positive for amphetamine. And so I had told him, I said, Josh, I don't use amphetamines. He's like, well, we know that you ha you're using amphetamines. We just don't know what type. We don't know if it's methamphetamine or amphetamine. He was an idiot. He didn't know what he was talking about. He said, no, it's a false positive. He said, well, what do you take? I said, I don't know. I use workout supplements, all legal ones. He's like, well, you're in a lot of trouble. We're sending it to the lab. And if it comes back and it's verified that it's an illicit narcotic, you're going to prison. We'll get into what happens with all that in the next video. Please like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Look at all the comments in the, or look at the pinned comment for all the links. I appreciate you guys. And we will see you next time. Palabra.